Hey guys, it's been a pleasure learning with all of you these last couple of months. I think that audio part of my videos is still good, and video part is getting better. I really enjoy doing this, but I blinked, and we are already past 900 subscribers, and I would like to do a humble little giveaway when we surpass 1000 since it was my ultimate goal, probably for most creators too. I am also aware that I am making content that probably won't be monetized, but truth is that experience and all people reaching out to me with beautiful comments and support is far more important to me right now. Thank you all who clicked that button and to all that watch my videos weekly. I hope I will meet your expectations in the future. Let's continue with our video now, shall we? Vladimir Georgievich Vinichevsky, also known as the Urals Monster, holds the grim distinction of being the youngest Soviet serial killer. Between 1938 and 1939, he committed 18 horrifying attacks on children aged 2 to 4 years old in Sverdlovsk, Nizhny Tagal, and Kushva, with eight of these attacks ending in tragedy. His reign of terror came to an end when he was sentenced to death on the 16th of January 1940, and he was executed just a few months later. Vladimir Vinichevsky, born in July 1923, came from a relatively well-off family in Sverdlovsk, Soviet Russia. His father, Georgi Ivanovich, held a position as a crew chief in municipal public utilities, while his mother, Elizaveta Petrovna, worked as an accountant. The family lived in a standalone private house in the city center, and by Soviet standards of the time, they were considered prosperous. Young Vladimir had possessions like a suit, a tank helmet, a Swiss knife, and leather shoes. He even had pocket money, amassing more than 20 rubles, equivalent to two days' salary for an average Soviet worker. Vinichevsky attended Sverdlovsk School, number 16, initially in the seventh grade. Due to his academic struggles, he had to repeat a grade at one point. However, he possessed a talent for singing and knew many songs by heart. During his formative years, Vinichevsky formed a friendship with Ernst Nizvestny, who would later become a renowned sculptor. Despite being two years older than Nizvestny, Vinichevsky attended school at an older age and repeated a grade, placing them in the same school year. They lived near each other and enjoyed shared activities such as going to school, watching movies, and attending Sverdlovsk's theater of musical comedy. Vinichevsky frequently visited Nizvestny's apartment. Nizvestny described Vinichevsky as a very reserved and introverted boy who preferred solitude. In school, he often stood in a corner or by the wall. When discussing girls, Vinichevsky expressed a strong aversion to sexual intercourse and claimed never to have engaged in it. Nizvestny also noticed that Vinichevsky spent an unusually long time in the restroom, though he remained unaware of his activities there. Vinichevsky's acts of violence were primarily centered in Sverdlovsk, but he deliberately extended his reach to other cities within the Sverdlovsk Oblast in an effort to confound investigators. Notably, one attack occurred in Nizhny Tagal, and another took place in Kushva. His victims spanned both genders, and the driving force behind these attacks was sexual in nature. Initially, Vinichevsky attempted to engage in what he considered natural acts with female victims, but he soon realized that anatomical constraints made this impossible. The murder of Gerda Gribanova provided crucial evidence for investigators, as a piece of the knife used was lodged in the girl's skull. Authorities removed her head for examination, retaining the skull as evidence, while the rest of her remains were returned to her parents for burial. Initially, it was assumed that the same kitchen knife had been used in subsequent crimes, but this assumption was later proven false. The fifth victim, a young boy who likely survived but remained unaccounted for, experienced a harrowing encounter. Vinichevsky proposed that four-year-old Borya Titov accompany him for sledding, but instead, he led the child to a desolate area and subjected him to harm. Fortunately, the child was rescued and subsequently cooperated with investigators to identify his attacker. The seventh victim was three-year-old Kate Lobanova in Kushva, who tragically lost her life. Her body was later disposed of in a swamp to mask the signs of decomposition. In Sverdlovsk, Vinichevsky altered his approach by abducting children, 
and committing violence in forested areas on the city's outskirts. There, he concealed their bodies beneath branches. This is how four-year-old Lita Serena and three-year-old Valya Kamaeva met their tragic fates in the spring of 1939. Subsequently, three-year-old Alia Gubina was kidnapped and subjected to assault by Vinichevsky. Afterward, he inflicted multiple knife wounds on her, including a 25-centimeter long wound. Remarkably, she survived and managed to escape, despite Vinichevsky not taking her more than one kilometer from the abduction site. These incidents occurred not only on the outskirts, but also near his residence on Maman Sibiriak Street, where he kidnapped two children. The final victim, four-year-old Taisia Morozov, met a gruesome end. Following her murder, Vinichevsky discarded her body in a cesspool and placed her clothing in the front garden of an apartment building, hoping that investigators would search there for her remains. The victims who were subjected to Vinichevsky's attacks and thrown into cesspools had minimal chances of escape, even if they were still alive. However, four-year-old Raya Ramatulina, whom Vinichevsky had thrown into a cesspool, miraculously regained consciousness and began to cry out, alerting passers-by who came to her rescue. The investigation into the abductions of children in Sverdlovsk posed numerous challenges for the local criminal investigation department. The kidnappings exhibited considerable variation, occurring in different locations and with distinct methods of disposing of the victims' bodies. Furthermore, surviving children were unable to provide clear descriptions of their abductor, complicating the efforts to identify the perpetrator. Adding to the complexity, some parents of victims did not report the incidents to the police. Investigators also grappled with erroneous assumptions about the murderer's identity. There was a widespread belief that the killer had a prior conviction, likely related to crimes against personal integrity. It was presumed that the perpetrator was a young adult, aged between 20 and 25, who appeared youthful or like a teenager. Some even speculated that the killer might have had mental health issues or was a degenerate. It wasn't until the summer of 1939 that all the known cases were finally linked together. However, it was determined that the attacks in Nizhny Tagal and Kushva were not connected to the Sverdlovsk murders. In 1939, Sverdlovsk saw the deployment of covert police patrols, with over 300 individuals arrested in the efforts to apprehend the perpetrator. A turning point in the investigation occurred on October 24, 1939, when three police high school cadets named Popov, Angelov, and Krylov made a crucial discovery. While patrolling near a tram stop in Verknyaya Pishma, they observed a tall man carrying a young boy into the forest. This man was Vladimir Vinichevsky, and he had abducted three-year-old Vyacheslav Volkov, who had been momentarily left at the entrance of his family's home by his mother. Vinichevsky swiftly seized the child and attempted to flee on a tram to evade his pursuers. The cadets, however, remained vigilant and followed Vinichevsky. They apprehended him just as he was choking young Vyacheslav. Thanks to the scarf around the child's neck, Vinichevsky had to unbutton his shirt to strangle the boy, leaving visible marks on his fingernails. This evidence left no room for alternative explanations or justifications of his actions. Following Vinichevsky's confession during the investigation, his parents, on November 1, 1939, publicly disowned him through an announcement in the regional newspaper, The Ural Worker, demanding the ultimate punishment, execution by shooting. The trial of Vinichevsky occurred under the backdrop of Soviet legislation that permitted the death penalty for minors above the age of 12. This law was introduced after a proposal by the People's Commissar for Defense, Klement Voroshilov, in response to rising child crime rates. Despite questions about its humanity, Joseph Stalin defended the law as having a pedagogical purpose, to deter both young offenders and those who organized delinquency among children. On January 16, 1940, Vinichevsky was sentenced to death by the Soviet court. He sought clemency, expressing a willingness to prove himself in battle and serve as a tanker during the ongoing Soviet-Finnish war. However, his plea for mercy was denied, and he was executed. In the Soviet Union, 
the bodies of executed individuals were not returned to their families for burial. Instead, they were interred in clandestine, undisclosed locations. It is believed that Vladimir Georgievich Vinichevsky was laid to rest approximately 12 kilometers from the Moscow tract. This burial site stands as the sole known resting place in the Sverdlovsk region, where the executed were buried during the 1930s. Notably, individuals executed for various reasons, including political and criminal charges like Vinichevsky, were all interred in a single mass grave without distinction. In the 1990s, this burial ground was transformed into a memorial complex dedicated to the victims of repression spanning from the 1920s to the 1950s. On November 20th, 2017, a poignant monument titled Masks of Sorrow, Europe, Asia was unveiled at this complex. This striking work of art was created by Ernst Nizvestny, a friend of Vinichevsky. As for Vinichevsky's case records, they are housed under case number 434. The State Archives of the Sverdlovsk region hold four volumes of the criminal case against Vladimir Georgievich Vinichevsky, which was adjudicated by the Sverdlovsk Regional Court in 1940. These volumes are stored in the Archives collection under Fund R-148, titled Sverdlovsk Regional Court, Inventory 2. In 2017, a media report claimed that Vinichevsky's case had been kept classified for over seven decades. However, the State Archives of the Sverdlovsk region refuted this assertion on March 16, 2018, confirming that Vinichevsky's case had been archived since 1991 and had been accessible to the public since then. In January 2018, A. Rakitin authored a two-volume book dedicated to Vinichevsky, titled The Urals Monster, chronicle of the exposure of the most mysterious serial killer of the Soviet Union. In this publication, the author introduced a theory suggesting that Vinichevsky may have had an accomplice in his heinous crimes. When you hear about cases like this, and when you read about cases like this, you cannot help but feel a sense of disgust for the perpetrators, experiencing both anger and sadness simultaneously. Every case is a tragic one, but cases that involve young children like this just hit differently. They deserve to have their stories told so they don't end up lost among case files on some shelves in basements. Goethe Grebanova, Borya Titov, Kate Lobanova, Lida Serena, Valya Kamaeva, Alya Gubina, Taisai Romozov, Nina Pleshcheyeva. These are some of the victims' names, either meeting their tragic end or surviving encounters with the monster. Let's not forget the victims. Thank you all who stick to the end of the video. If you have any thoughts, please share with me in the comments down below. Click a like if you like this video and let me know if you have any more interesting cases like this. I want to give a big shout out to a I am Adams who recommended this case in the comments section. Thank you. I am Alex, and this is Conundrum. Stay curious and stay safe.